today's esteemed guest, Dr. Devi Prasad Shetty, titled Fighting the Pandemic, Leading from the Front. Today's talk is based on a chapter that Dr. Shetty has authored in the book Modi at 20, Dreams Meet Delivery, about the COVID-19 pandemic and the resulting challenges. I would now like to invite our Dean of Student Affairs, Professor Siddharth Panda, to introduce the speaker. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the speaker, Dr. Devi Prasad Shetty, Chairman, Naran Hurdayala Limited. A cardiac surgeon of repute and a successful entrepreneur, Dr. Shetty is a highly respected luminary for his ingenious ideas for reforms in the healthcare sector. His visionary leadership to make quality healthcare affordable for all has drawn global recognition. In association with the government of Karnataka, Dr. Shetty pioneered Yashashwini, an inexpensive micro health insurance scheme benefiting more than 3.4 million rural poor. A strong advocate of technology for efficient healthcare delivery, Dr. Shetty takes deep interest in creating and developing software products and applications to achieve time and cost efficiency while minimizing clinical errors in healthcare delivery. Dr. Shetty is a recipient of several prestigious awards, including the Padma Bhushan and Padma Shri. Dr. Shetty is the founder and chairman at the Naren Hrudalayar Group of Hospitals, which now has 47 healthcare facilities with close to 7,000 beds. He is also one of the advisory board members of the upcoming Gangwal School of Medical Science and Technology at IIT Kanpur. With this brief introduction, I would like to invite Dr. Shetty to the stage to deliver his talk. Dr. Shetty. Good evening. I just want to take this uh, opportunity to ask you one question. Do you know you are one of the real, real, real privileged Indian kids? You are perhaps the 0.00001% of Indian population to have the privilege of getting admitted to IIT Kanpur. Because I just want you to think or compare, if you add my marks from first standard to 10th standard or before I joined the medical college and multiply by 100, still I wouldn't be able to get into this institution. Now you know where you stand. So with all the humility, I would like to congratulate you that you are the privileged ones and the country expects a lot from you. Okay, that's the responsibility. No privilege comes without responsibility. I uh, would like to talk to you, not just about the book, it's about the dream, a realistic dream, which will become a reality uh, soon. I believe that India will become the first country in the world to dissociate healthcare from affluence. India will prove to the world that the wealth of the nation has nothing to do with the quality of healthcare its citizens can enjoy. And it's going to happen within the next five to 10 years time, hopefully in my lifetime. Why I am optimistic it will happen? It will happen predominantly because of the leadership we have today. Prime Minister Modi, before he became Prime Minister, he was the Chief Minister of Gujarat. He was the only Chief Minister who visited our hospital twice and spent at least two hours on each occasion constantly asking questions 
from uh, answer, seeking answers from me, my colleagues, and everyone to understand how this industry or how this sector can be transformed and make it affordable to everyone. And eventually, when I decided to build a hospital in Ahmedabad, uh, normally it takes about one to two years to get a, part, a portion of the land to build a hospital. We got it within one month. That's the reason why we could build a hospital in Ahmedabad. So I've been interacting with him for quite some time before he became the prime minister. And I was fascinated and amazed at the depth of knowledge he has in my area of healthcare. So I'm optimistic that massive transformation in healthcare will happen. And I will, in the next few minutes, I will explain to you, uh, giving the example of COVID. I believe India has done the best compared to any other developed country in the world in managing COVID-19 pandemic. I have no doubt about this statement, and I will explain to you why. First of all, let me start off. In 2014, when Prime Minister Modi became the uh, Prime Minister, we had uh, 82,000 undergraduate and post-graduation seats. It took 70 years for India to have 82,000 medical undergraduation and post-graduation seats. And in 2022, we have nearly 1.48 lakh medical seats in PG and UG, nearly doubled in just about seven years, we have doubled the number of undergraduation and post-graduation seats. So this additional number of doctors working in the hospital, medical students, they gave phenomenal strength through the Indian healthcare system to face the pandemic. When you see a lot of things happening outside reading the newspaper, you may not have the understanding about how these things happen. It is the young doctors and nurses who take care of the patients in the hospital. People like us, we come and do the rounds, give the advice and go on and go to the outpatient or surgery or whatever. The real care is provided by them. The, uh, around, uh, I think about a couple of years ago, Medical Council of India, which was a body which was controlling medical education, was changed to National Medical Commission. Now, what is the difference? The difference is Medical Council of India was an elected body, and National Medical Commission is a selected body. So the right kind of people who are not going to stand for the election, who do not need to play for the gallery, can be chosen, and the right policies can be implemented. This, I thought, was never possible. The, uh, two years ago, na a National Board of Examination called DNB, it's like a university, which launched two-year diploma courses in anesthesia, gynecology, pediatrics, and all these basic specialties. Now, what is the implication? The implication is that any hospital in the country with over 100 beds with qualified medical specialists can become an academic institution training medical specialists. It's very, very important for a country like India to have large number of uh, uh, medical specialists. And today, if you go to any uh, developed country like US and Europe, most of these doctors, leading doctors, are from India. About 30,000 Indian doctors work in England. So when we train doctors, we cannot look at only what is the requirement of India. We should look at the requirement of the, can I have the hand mic? It's, it's here? Yeah. So we, as a country, we cannot look at 
what our requirement alone is. We need to look at the requirement of the world. So, essentially, uh, it is very, very important for a country like India to develop the manpower for the world. And for this, all these steps are important. And because of these steps, we had adequate manpower, may not be real adequate, but sufficient manpower to manage the COVID pandemic. COVID started on the January 30th, and uh, by March 11th, WHO declared it as a pandemic. And the government declared lockdown on the uh, 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 25th of March. And when we were watching the scenario of migrant laborers walking for a long distance because there was no transportation, it was pathetic. It was a sad scenario. It was very touching. Now, one wondered, was lockdown really required at that time? Or whether you could have planned it better? We couldn't have planned it better. Because the COVID pandemic, when it came, no one had an idea as how to manage COVID. Doctors like us were petrified. We had no idea whether we had no idea how to treat this COVID pandemic. We had no idea what medicines to give. We had no idea more than anything else. It's okay, I'll manage. Yeah, you can, in case I need, I'll give it. The, we had no idea what medicines will work. Nobody knew, but fortunately for us, unfortunately for England and US, they had COVID one year ahead of us. So, sorry, a few months ahead of us. So we doctors, we could interact with doctors in England and US and understand how they are managing COVID. That was a turning point. We needed a breathing time. We needed a, 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 a one month gap between actually pandemic rising in number and our understanding of the disease gets uh, uh, more, uh, uh, more better or solidified. And we learned so much from these doctors. First thing is, we were sure about, we are not sure about our own life. Imagine if you have a large number of doctors and nurses who are only supposed to worry about the patient's life, are worried about their own life. Because what if I get the COVID? What will happen to me? What will happen to my wife and children? We had no answer. But looking at the way doctors were treating in England and US, we were assured, you're OK. As long as you wear a mask and PPE, you're protected. Once we are sure, then you can rest assured we'll take care of the patient. Because whatever said and done, for everyone, including us, our life is more precious than the patient's life. This is the reality. So once we are assured that we are OK, then half the battle was won then we learned amazing lessons. First thing, that steroid is the drug which works like a magic in COVID patients. That was unthinkable, because steroid is the last drug to be given in any infection. Because steroid reduces the antigen, the, the reaction of your body to fight against the disease. But steroid is a lifesaver. Today, if any country can boast of outstanding results, it's predominantly because of the steroid and oxygen. And when the COVID started, we all were worried. We knew that it's going to affect lungs. So we thought ventilator is the most important equipment. So there was a lot of effort made in uh, uh, producing ventilators and IIT Kanpur, all the leadership here, they have contributed significantly in developing the technology. Eventually, we had ventilators, but we realized soon enough that ventilator is a last resort. And ventilator has to be given, used only towards the end. All these lessons we learned in that precious 30 days or 40 days of uh, lockdown period, without, when the number of COVID was just rising, but it wasn't enough to overwhelm the health system. So, 
we went through a lot of problem during the first lockdown, but that was justified. And that helped us to save millions of lives in the end. It's very interesting. Ventilator is a very, very important component in managing ICU. But do you know what would have saved equally number of lives without the ventilator? The prone ventilation. Prone ventilation is when somebody has severe lung infection, when the blood gases really, really goes down. All you have to do, normally we sleep like this, you put them on their belly, and they sleep on the belly, oxygen level dramatically increases. That knowledge alone has saved thousands and thousands of lives. But we learnt all this at somebody else's expense. And all that happened during that lockdown period with great interaction between our doctors, American doctors and European doctors. So I'm just trying to answer you know, the questions you may not answer, uh, ask, that is, was lockdown really required? Lockdown was required. And lockdown was required when the country was not overwhelmed with the uh, infection. <clears throat> the, uh, now, as young people, you always hear this discussion about make in India. Why make in India? We should be only talking about the globalization. Let everybody make everything, let's use from each other. If I need something, I can import from another country. If they need something, we can export it to them. So essentially, we thought this is the ideal way where everyone will grow. But in reality, it doesn't work like that. I will give you one example. When COVID number was increasing, we wanted to stock large number of ventilators. We have 300 ICU beds in one building. We wanted to add another 200 beds. And at the peak of COVID, we added 800 critical care beds. Now, we needed ventilators. Obviously, in India, that many ventilators were not available. We keep buying ventilators from various, I don't like to name the company, uh, name the country, various countries' uh, ventilators. We constantly buy from them. We are one of the largest number of largest buyers of these medical equipments. About 14% of the heart surgery done in India is done by us. You can imagine how much we buy from all these companies. I knew all the CEOs and the chairman of all these companies. As usual, I called them saying that we need 20 ventilators or 50 ventilators. They said, I'm sorry, we can't give you now. Our government has prohibited us from exporting these items. We are worried about saving our people's life. And the vital equipment for this, not made in India, is made by somebody else, and we want it, and right at that time, they refuse to sell. Then what do you do? And the same thing with the, the, the components of medicines. India, a country with 1.3 billion population, has to work on globalization. Globalization is very, very important, but everything vital for our survival we have to make it. There is no other choice. I am not saying that means we shouldn't bring things from outside or import it. That is very, very important. Globalization is the only way forward. But we are not a country with 5 million, 10 million population. We are a country of 1.3 billion people. For us, make in India is a question of survival. When the COVID really happened, when the numbers started increasing, we realized that we all have to wear PPEs. As a doctor working in different parts of the world for more than 35, 37 years, I never knew what PPE was. I never knew what N95 mask was. We realized without that, we are not going to protect our young doctors. Our young doctors were entering COVID ICU with raincoat and the motorcycle helmet to cover their face. Because there was only one company in India making PPEs, there was hardly any company making N95 mask. So that was the situation. We didn't even have a cloth mask available. But the way the entire uh, the government, central government, state government, they all started working together. 
in few months time less than 2 3 months time we have few hundred companies making ppes n95 masks we are virtually becoming net exporter that was a magical transformation that couldn't have happened without the entrepreneurship of the indian industrialists industries and the young people as well as the patronage and the encouragement from the government the there was when the covid started there was hardly uh, 17000 ventilators uh, uh, available in the country and in few months time uh, 17000 ventilators the government hospitals today government 50,000 ventilators. So everything got changed in a remarkably short period of time. The, uh, now, all of you have seen pathetic picture photographs of people, regular people, running around in, on the streets with oxygen tanker on their back to save the life of their loved, loved ones. It was a sad scenario. And we felt, what is going on? Can't we provide oxygen to these people to save their life? It is a basic ingredient. What is the problem? The reality is, COVID is the first disease known to mankind where a COVID patient in the ICU, do you know how much oxygen they require? they require 86,000 liters of oxygen per day. A regular patient you see uh, in the ICU may require two liters, three liters uh, per hour. That's what we adjust. 86,000 liters per patient. It's called high flow oxygen. And medical oxygen is not made by any company for the purpose of medical use. Because medical use is very, very small. Most of the oxygen developed, produced by the company are meant for industrial purposes, especially steel mills. So for a company which is making medical oxygen, selling medical oxygen, we are a tiny part of their business. They are rounding off figure. We are not very important. But there was enough oxygen to keep the show going, and we were dependent on these companies. Now, medical oxygen is predominantly made by companies in eastern India. Why eastern India? Because that's where all the steel mills are, and that is where maximum amount of oxygen is consumed. And most people don't live in eastern India. They live rest of the India. Now, that oxygen from eastern India has to be shifted on the road to southern India, western India, central India, all over the country. And to shift the oxygen, you need specialized containers called cryogenic containers. Do you know when COVID happened, how many containers we had? We had only 1,224 cryogenic containers. They can only carry a limited, uh, uh, limited weight of the oxygen because if they overload it, our roads cannot take it. So these oxygen tankers are strictly governed. They have a speed limit. They can't, because there is a need for oxygen in some part of the country, they can't drive faster to reach there. Regulation doesn't allow because if they drive fast, it can explode. It is a combustible. So you have limited number of oxygen containers from one part of the country to the other part of the country. You have to shift it. So the, uh, at the peak of the COVID wave, uh, the, 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 the government initiated railways to carry the oxygen cylinders and uh, the, the aviation, the, the, in the plane, the army and all the forces were included. They all shifted empty uh, cryogenic cylinders back so that that time at least he saved. So using Air Force, Navy and all kinds of forces, we managed. But in Delhi, there was a problem. Why Delhi had a problem? 
Delhi had a problem because every big city has some industries. When there is industries, there is oxygen plant to serve the industry. And that oxygen plant gives little bit of oxygen to every hospital. And that's the way it runs. Because of the pollution problem, an oxygen plant which was functioning in Delhi many years ago was shut and shifted. So Delhi is one of the densely populated cities which didn't have their own oxygen. So they had a problem. So essentially, uh, in spite of that, they managed to save millions of lives with the huge logistical nightmare of shifting the oxygen. Now, is this the Indian story? Only in India, people died because there was no oxygen or a intensive care beds? No. Every country, including the developed countries, have lost patients because they had no ICU with oxygen connection available. I will give you my personal experience of my relative in England. I'm a product of National Health Service of England, which is a phenomenal system, great system. Even in England and US, they only have a limited number of beds with the oxygen connection. Why we don't see the photograph of an American or an Englishman trying to uh, carry oxygen home? Because in those countries, you cannot buy oxygen from off the shelf. There are no distributors. Only selected people can get it. In India, oxygen is available in the open market. So people are ingenious enough to know, if I don't get ICU bed, let me create ICU bed in my home. So they ran around. And that is why only Indians were projected in this poor light. It happened in every part of the country. So in England, my uh, relative, a young lady, had COVID, very bad COVID. She, her husband called the ICU. They said, OK, as long as oxygen saturation is 95, it's OK. And if it goes lower, you call. It reached 90. He called. They said, OK, as long as it is 80, it's OK. So the, like this, they kept on. The oxygen level really went down to 70. And she didn't get the ICU bed because she was young. She managed to survive. She is healthy today. If she was an elderly person, she would have died. But there wouldn't be any pathetic photograph for every, the whole world to watch because my colleagues in those countries were told, who are working in the ICU, that you have to choose between whose life has to be saved and who should be allowed to die. When you have limited number of beds, what do you do? So, COVID killed that many people, not because it is a very, very severe disease. It is because healthcare system was overwhelmed. If there was enough beds available, there was enough oxygen and the medicines, people wouldn't have died. We could have easily managed. But every country has a limited number of COVID, uh, the, the ICU beds. So the uh, essentially, uh, uh, going forward, the vaccination. I'm very proud to say that India has vaccinated more people than whole of North America, South America, Africa, and Europe put together. And we are one of the five countries in the world to uh, uh, have the capability to develop vaccine by ourselves. Now, what is the good thing about COVID? The good thing about COVID is a lot of unthinkable things have become a reality. One is telemedicine. I treated over 53,000 patients remotely with the telemedicine. But telemedicine was illegal. Because of the COVID, telemedicine got legalized, and a lot of people could consult doctors online. The, uh, look at the digital payment. Today, we are the largest country in the world uh, who is transacting something like $25.5 billion of money. Uh, and China is the second largest with 15 uh, a billion transaction. So now, I am giving you all the ringside view because I was an observer sitting on the ringside view. I was one of the members of Supreme Court Task Force monitoring what the government is doing 
in managing the healthcare. So everything what I said, I have observed it myself. Now, the, I, I just want to ask you, you know, allow you to ask questions and I would like to answer your questions rather than me uh, uh, continuing to talk. I just want to let you know that healthcare today has some of the things what it can offer, which is nothing short of magic. And unfortunately, not many people can afford. I'll give you one example of how these kind of a, uh, facil the, the medical treatments can offer virtually magical transformation. I'll show you one video what healthcare can do. There was a 70-year-old man who came to our hospital a couple of months ago, and uh, he was operated by us uh, 20 years earlier. He was doing very well, but two years ago, he developed leakage in one of the heart valves, and the valve was not functioning. He was in severe heart failure. His pumping action was reduced to 15%. Heart was barely able to contract. And the uh, heart was barely able to contract. And uh, I was asked to see him. I saw him. He had lung problem. He's 70 year old with all kinds of comorbid conditions. And our cardiologist said, we, he can't do anything. We can't replace the valve. And one option we had is a procedure called TAVI. TAVI is a procedure in which we pass a wire from the groin and we replace the valve. But that wasn't possible uh, in the normal position, so we thought we'll put it in slightly different position. So the procedure was done. And this is a 70-year-old man with the huge, big stomach because of the water collection, uh, swelling up the legs, and he was barely able to walk. And we decided to do the TAVI. It took us, uh, my cardiologist, about 10 minutes. We had a chat with the family. Initially, we told them that nothing can be done and we are not going to uh, do any procedure, indirectly saying that you know, nothing can be done to save his life. And then we changed our mind. We said we can put the valve in some other position, and that's what we did. And my colleague cardiologist took 10 minutes to do it. This patient came to my clinic one month later, just one month later, wearing a tracksuit. Uh, when a patient walks into our office with a tracksuit, we know that we don't need to ask them any question as how the patient is doing, because tracksuit gives an indication that he's doing very well. So I ch chatted with him for a few minutes, and then I, uh, I, when I was about to, uh, when we finished, when he was about to leave, he asked me a question in Hindi. Aapse kuch puchna hai, he said. I said, boliye. Then he said, my office is 10 kilometers away. I always used to go on a scooter. And can I go back to work on a scooter? Then I said, yeah, sure. But the day you go, the first day, take a video and send it to me. And this is the video. This is nothing short of magic. When mentally family is prepared for him to die, and when the, uh, the doctors say that we have nothing to offer. Then we decide to do something else. And the patient leaves the hospital after three, four days. And one month later, he's riding a scooter. This is nothing short of magic. So my last video I wanted to show you all, how many of you all know that your institution is developing an artificial heart? Yes. IIT Kanpur is in the process of developing an artificial heart, and I believe it will be ready within two years. Now, I tell you how the journey started. Journey, our journey in artificial heart, implanting artificial heart, started 15 years ago. And those days, that was the, we were the first hospital in Asia to put an artificial heart. In the whole world, hardly 500, 600 people had the artificial heart. And we had one patient. The reason why I want to show you the video is that when your team is working on artificial heart, you, today it is not possible to implant because these artificial hearts cost 50 lakh to 1 crore rupees. So our patient cannot afford. 
So we want to develop a very advanced artificial heart, which is affordable by a common man. And I just want to give a glimpse of what impact it will have a common man. This video was shot 15 years ago, and I almost forgot about it. Since I was coming here, I thought I should uh, show all of you to understand what is happening in your own hospital, in your own institution, and the impact it will have. This was the voice of mine when I was a much younger man. Heart failure is the commonest cause of death. Death due to heart failure can be prevented by implanting an artificial heart, which is run by a rechargeable battery. This device costs approximately 50 lakh rupees, and there are about 600 people in this that world leading a very active life with this artificial heart. Biggest concern people have about the artificial heart is the quality of life and the restriction this implant does it on their life. Mr. Chennarasapa from Haveri is a poor farmer living in a hut without stable power supply. He has an artificial heart implanted at Narayan Vidalaya over a year ago. He leads a very active life, takes part in farming, goes for a long ride on his motorcycle. He can even perform heavy manual labor. Lack of electricity doesn't bother him since he has a generator set which recharges his battery. Mr. Chenna Basappa is very happy with his life with the artificial heart. Believe me, just about a year ago, Mr. Chenna Basappa couldn't get out of the bed and go to the toilet. Today he is enjoying a long ride on a motorcycle with his father. This is what healthcare can offer. This is what you all can do it. So it's a great privilege for me to interact with you, and I'm very happy to answer any of your questions. I can hear you. Yeah, you can speak. Yes. See, the, India is a very unique country where uh, amazing things happen. One example is India has democratized entertainment. Today, the hit movies in Telugu, Kannada, English, whatever, if it is made, even the poorest man in India can watch that movie. There is no separate movie made only for the billionaires to watch. And they can watch it in a 2,000 rupees uh, mobile phone, sitting out inside their house. So India has democratized uh, the, uh, the uh, entertainment uh, industry. Now, India has democratized mobile communication. When mobile ca phones came, it was only for the rich people. Today, every Indian has a mobile phone. So essentially, our strength is our number. We believe that with all the digitization happening, most of the healthcare will be delivered online. Like Uber is the world's largest uh, transporting agency, which doesn't own a single car. Airbnb is the largest hotel room provider, which doesn't own uh, any uh, hotel rooms. Alibaba is the world's largest retail agent without any inventory. Largest healthcare provider in the world will have no beds. It is going to be a software. And that software has to be developed by all of you. And this is the future. Do not speculate the future based on the uh, previous old uh, tools. The tools of future are different. 
and how that tool is developed is all in your minds. And you develop the new tool, the problem will be solved. I'm audible. Okay, yes. it's, uh, it's my honor to talk to you. Thank you for very much for the talk. So I've had this question for a long time. So uh, finally, I have somebody to ask it to. So when the lockdown actually was imposed in India, so as we all know, India is a very poor country. I think if my numbers are correct, I think maybe 5 lakh children die from malnutrition every year. So when the government took the decision to impose the lockdown, we knew the consequence. You mentioned the migrant laborers, they'll be working. But not only that, you'll kill the economy, you'll kill all the jobs. People won't have money. Money is one thing, but they won't have food to eat. And already such a poor country, we, we don't have money to f feed everybody. So many more people will die from malnutrition. The government knew that. Not only that, it'll have long-term consequences. Even child marriage, teenage pregnancy, healthcare, all these things, everybody knew. You'll cut off transport. People can't go anywhere to get healthcare for their regular food. Ration you'll cut off. So while we took lockdown, we were saving people in the hospital, yes. But the poor people of India, right? We were actually killing them by, doing, by taking such a decision. So when we always say we save people by lockdown, but so many poor people we killed. And not only that year, it will happen for so many more years because of the long-term consequences of the lockdown. So since you were in that position, you were making this decision. So what was the idea of the government or what, how did they consider these things? Because they don't have any social media, the poor, people, the poor people to talk about all these things, right? So this is my question. See, the retrospectively, we are always much cleverer. When the decision of lockdown is taken, nobody knew whether government or the private or the doctors or the policy makers had no clue what we are dealing with. We had no idea what it is going to be. Today, we are very confident we are all sitting here without a mask, right? And last, the, the uh, earlier without mask, I wouldn't even get out of the bed. So essentially, if we had all the data, we could have taken phenomenal decisions. Many things what we did, we wouldn't have done if we knew it is going to be like this. I'll give you one example. We had a first COVID wave, second COVID wave, third COVID wave. In reality, there was no third COVID wave. Third COVID wave came only because of the testing. COVID-19 behaved exactly like Spanish flu, which hit the world in 1920. It lasted for 18 months. COVID behaved exactly like that. Now, why Spanish flu lasted 18 months is because there was no test for a Spanish flu. So after 18 months, there was nobody getting admitted to a hospital, and they said Spanish flu is over. Today, everyone with a cold and cough, they undergo the test, is told positive, then the media writes about it. We are constantly living under the fear. Because of the fear of third COVID wave, with the new version, with all the complications, Doctors in South Africa kept on telling us that it is very mild, it is not affecting the lungs. Don't lose your sleep, don't go to this extent. But we didn't want to take a chance. So we went out of the way. We added 800 critical care beds, spending crores of rupees. At the peak of third COVID wave, we had 27 patients in the hospital for 800 beds. We lost huge amount of money. Now, Retrospectively, that's the stupidest thing to do. We had a huge, we have a huge nursing college which accommodates nearly 1,000 students. We closed that, converted each and every uh, the corner of the nursing college as an intensive care unit with central oxygen and beds and everything. All that money is gone, wasted. So retrospectively, we can judge on every decision what is taken. But we have to look at what was the thought process at that time. And at that time, the decision what was taken is more or less the right decision taken for that time. Today, it is a stupid decision. I agree. So, uh, we already have apps like Practo, which like, provide access to the urban elite. Like, we have, uh, I myself have, have like, consulted doctors using Practo. But 
what can we as technology to increase access to for last mile healthcare for the underprivileged sections of society? Like, what are the challenges that remain to be solved? See the. Uh, if you are going to develop a tool for the medical practitioner, like doctors like us to use, there are few sound fundamentals you have to understand. First thing, whatever app you develop, do not produce a keyboard. Because doctors are not designed by God to type. <laughs> so if you produce a keyboard, they are not going to use it. First thing. The second thing is, do not give them an instruction manual. Doctors think they know everything. If you have to ask them to go to the instruction manual or somebody has to coach you how to use the application, they won't use it. It has to be very intuitive. That is the second thing. And the third thing, if you expect them to spend huge amount of money to buy, they will not buy it. Right? I don't want to get into the detail as, so it has to be given to them on a SaaS model, pay as you use. So if you uh, follow these uh, uh, fundamentals and do not develop that application for a desktop, develop it for the mobile phone, whatever complicated it is. Because doctors look at the desktop five to six times in a day, but they look at the mobile phone 200 times in a day. So if you want to, like, you know, let me, I'm not sure whether I can, I, I'll show you, give you one example, how I can run my ICU from here. The, essentially, any tool uh, can be used, uh, developed for the mobile phone, and that is the best way to, uh, one second. At the bottom, there is an application called Adi, which is uh, a tool developed for the doctors. So today, uh, after the heart surgery, I don't go to ICU to see the patients. Uh, I can see everything about the patient in my phone. Uh, this is how, it works more or less like WhatsApp, but it is developed with all the uh, security and other features. Like, there are 600 patients in my hospital, but I am responsible for 20 patients, so my 20 patients are here. The pink suggests the patient is in the ICU, blue suggests he's in the ward. So I can get any detail about any patient I want. Let me pick up one patient. So whatever happened, I want to see the cardiac monitor, I can see the cardiac monitor. I can see every few hours doctors write the progress notes in the ICU. So 20 members of my team, we can see what is going on with the patient. And if the doctor doesn't write the progress note in six, every six hours, the software will remind progress notes not written. So the doctor will be questioned. So any, uh, uh, the, uh, one of the biggest problem is patients, family always say that, you know, nobody take, took care of us or nobody did anything. So, all the activity patient does in the ICU, you can record it and store it. In the court of law, if you have to show what are the things we did, we can show. Any blood test, anything happening, it will come directly to the phone. You take the chest x-ray, chest x-ray come. Five years ago, I never thought I will take clinical decision based on the x-ray I see in the phone. Today, that's a norm. Because this is very important because if you develop the application for the desktop, to see a chest X-ray, first I should identify a desktop. And there are few desktop in the ICU. Then you have to first put your ID, which is a 14-digit number, nobody remembers. So you have to have your glasses and one paper with your ID number. Then you put it. Then you put patient's MRN number, which is again 14-digit number. So you invariably, so best thing is not to see the X-ray. Now it comes in your phone. So essentially, you have to change uh, the entire process of building these tools to make our life comfortable. So the, I'll give an example. You look at the nurse's uh, uh, job in the ward. Like a ward has 30 patients and there are nurses. What is their job? They go to one bed, 
with the BP apparatus, temperate thermometer. They uh, uh, check the blood pressure, shove the thermometer into their mouth or whatever, waits there for one minute, then she looks at it. It's not very easy to see. Then she will shake it. Then she will look, count the respiratory rate. Then she will uh, the, uh, the, uh, look at the patient's skin color and all the things. Then she will write everything. That process takes 15 minutes. Okay? Then she will go to the next bed. She will do the same thing, like this. If there are 30 patients, by the time she finishes that, it is the time for her to start it all over again. Imagine going for a work, an intelligent person, smart girl, if she has to do this job from 9 o'clock till 5 o'clock, and at night if she's on duty, 12 o'clock if she goes to the bedside and wants to check the blood pressure, which is mandated she has to check, patient who is fast asleep will wake up. First thing what the patient will do, patient will scream at the nurse. So, what she can do, if she doesn't record it, next day she will be questioned. So, she will bluff. This is the uniform system. We are forcing the healthcare professionals to bluff because we haven't created an alternative system. Right? So, this is not common in India alone. It happens in England, it happens in Europe, all over the world. Okay. Now, we have decided that we want our, what is the idea of developing technology? We want doctors and nurses and technicians to be happy working in the hospital. We want to bring back the joy of healthcare. We want to bring back the joy of taking care of the patient. Today, that joy has gone. Because when my teachers were treating patients, Every data they wanted, they were physically getting it from the patient. They had a stethoscope, they would put it on the chest, and they could spend half an hour examining the patient and come up with the diagnosis. All they had some blood test and maybe x-ray. Ultrasound was never there. CT scan was not invented. So they were very happy in diagnosis. Today, thousands of tests are available. Everything is tested. And we have only five to eight minutes with the patient. We cannot decipher all the data and come up with the conclusion. So we are unhappy. Nurses are unhappy. Now what do you do? We, we are working with the Honeywell, which produce a patch. You put the patch on all the ward nurses. We continuously get the ECG, we get the blood pressure, we get the temperature, we get the oxygen saturation, respiratory rate, and on the nurse station there is a TV which gives the patient's name and there are three flags, green, orange, and red. Any our analytics uh, tools developed, is developed to show what is the risk score. Then when the flag turns orange or green, then the nurse will go to the patient and examine the patient, understand what is going on, and take it. That is interesting. Then they will be interested. So this is all we have to do. So like this, Whatever tools you are going to develop, understand our pain points. Then develop. First develop the tools for the doctors and the nurses, then the patients. Because once the doctors and patients want it, they will make sure patients will use it. Yeah. yeah. How do we ensure maximum impact is created among the economically underprivileged sections of the society? using digital tools, especially in places where digital infrastructure is underdeveloped? It's uh, the, the, you mean to say the people who are poor, how do you access these data? I mean, the uh, online consultation and these things. Yeah, I wish I had the photograph, I wish I could have shown you. Uh, a typical patient I consult is uh, generally from Eastern India. And uh, especially, you know, the people who are living, there are photographs I consult. When I look at the background, I could see they live in a thatch roof house with stray dogs everywhere. And these are the people who confidently speak to the doctors. Today, doctors like me, sitting in a city and they are in a village. You know why they do that? Because they are, we have allowed them to communicate with us in WhatsApp. If I develop a tool of my own, 
then expect those people to download it and use it. They were not going to communicate with me. Today, WhatsApp is used by everybody. They know how the on button is. I was running online clinic during COVID with the, our own application. So the typical experience is, supposing I use the Zoom for a uh, online consultation, uh, they're on waiting list and uh, they wait for half an hour and these poor people invariably have a prepaid card. When their term comes after 15 minutes, the data is over and they can't see me and they are unhappy. So if they're lucky, if they get to see me, first two minutes, I only hear the voice. I don't see the video because they would have uh, muted the video. Then I explain to them that there is a button, you have to switch it on. Then that takes two, three minutes. They will switch on the video, automatically the audio goes off. Then I see them, but I can't hear them. That was the experience. Now when I use WhatsApp, uh, sometimes my uh, mic is, uh, phone is on mute. They tell me, Dr. Saab, you mute me hai. Wo button dabana hai. <laughs> so we have to understand the psyche of the people. So technology is nothing but the level of comfort. So I don't want to, I'm not working for WhatsApp. I'm just talking about, I'm willing to change anything. I'm willing to use anybody's product as long as my patients like to use. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for a truly enriching talk. I would like to invite the Associate Dean of Student Affairs for a vote of thanks. Ah. Thank you all. Um, my special thanks goes to Dr. Devi Shetty for taking his time out uh, from such a busy schedule, coming to IIT Kanpur and inspiring all of us uh, with tales about how India handled the pandemic. Uh, my thanks to the director and his office for facilitating the event. Thanks to the Dean of Academic Affairs for providing the hall, the IWD for all the stage arrangements, uh, the floral arrangements and all of this. The visitors hostel for the high tea outside, the security uh, for arranging. The media cell, because they are recording this and it should be available uh, after the event. We will be posting it on YouTube, I am guessing. The publisher has made some of the books available uh, outside, so you can all browse the books to see. Uh, there are other chapters as well. Uh, the audience, of course, for uh, filling up the hall and uh, asking questions, probing questions for all of us. And finally, uh, this was a student event, so I thank all the students, the students Jimkhana, they are the ones who have made this uh, happen. So all the volunteers, all the students. Thank you all, thank you. Before we wrap up today's event, I would like to mention that we actually have a Campus Connect with Dr. Shetty. Of the lakhs of people who have received healthcare at Narayana Health, one is the case of Ayansh Katyar, who underwent life-saving surgery in 2017 at one and a half years old. Ayansh's father, Vipin Katyar, works as a senior pharmacist at the health center and has been associated with the institute since 2007. After facing rejection from several medical institutions for his son's health care, Vipinji turned to the deputy director for help and was able to receive the required help thanks to Narayana Health in the first such case from IIT Kanpur. We would like to wholeheartedly thank Dr. Shetty on behalf of Vipinji. This brings us to the end of a wonderful evening. I'm sure this has been a delightful experience for everyone present here today. Thank you.